<clears throat> Thanks. So uh, the driveway moment, um, our uh, I guess stock and trade. Um, I am. I, I want to talk about sort of what uh, the way what I think about when I think about how to create compelling audio, um, and what I think about what when I think about what a driveway moment is is it's it's something you don't want to turn off. It's something that you can't stop listening to. So how do you create just with words and silence? something that somebody can't stop listening to. Um, that's what I want to talk about today. And it's hard um, and it's sort of something that you need luck, but you also there is also tricks and little bits of craft that you can employ so that when the luck strikes, you, 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 can, you can take it and, and make it something good. Um, and so I'm going to talk about, and these are sort of tricks that I've learned over 15 or so years trying to, trying to, trying to do this, trying to create as many driveway moments as I can. Um, and I, <sighs> So one of the things that, that I um, love about audio uh, is that it feels very um, authentic. Uh, you f uh, when somebody's telling the truth, you feel like you can tell that they're telling the truth. And in fact, there's science to back this up. Um, I can't actually cite the study, but I know it's real because I talked about this study that I'm about to tell you about. I talked about it for a long time in this class that I taught. And in the back of my mind, I was like, am I making this study up, or did it actually happen? But then one of my students actually found the study and then forwarded it to me, but I lost that forward. But it really did. It has been confirmed that this study actually existed. Somebody somewhere did a media study where they had a lie put in three different forms of media, in, on the television news, on the, in radio, and in print. Um, and then they tried to figure out how many people could detect the lie through those different media. Um, and it turns out that radio is the easiest medium through which to detect a lie. In other words, it is hardest to lie to people through radio. Um, and that fact, I think, is core to what makes compelling audio, is that uh, what audio loves is people speaking honestly and emotionally honestly. Um, and, someone, and when people are telling deep truths, that sort of resonates very, really, really well. Um, and when that is happening, when you've, and, and often one of, the, one of the best moments, and so how many of you, you go out, you get good tape, and then you, and you come back, you, get, you, you do an interview, and you come back, and you're like, this guy was just talking like in, they weren't saying anything real. It was like they were talking, it was like a PR person, you know, like how many of you, who's the worst person to interview? If you have to choose, polit politici politicians, athletes. exactly. Politicians and athletes, exactly. <laughs> absolutely, because they have absolutely no incentive to tell you the truth, ever. They cannot talk honestly about like, yeah, I really thought we were going to lose that game, or uh, yes, I'm pandering in order to get votes. Like they can't tell you that. Uh, and so they're always going to be lying to you emotionally. Um, and so, um, but one of the most amazing moments on, on, that you can get on radio is when somebody is, starts out being inauthentic and then arrives, sort of resolves into an honest moment. Um, and that can happen anywhere. So I want to play you this um, clip. Uh, and it starts here. We're going to start this segment off with Carrie in Kankakee, Illinois, WKAN 1320. Hi, Carrie. How are you? Hi. How are you? Good. How can I help? So this is a clip from the Dave Ramsey Show. Anybody heard of the Dave Ramsey Show? So Dave Ramsey is a, is a, is a radio host, and he does a financial radio show. He sort of uh, talks to, pe to people about its, uh, financial literacy and getting out of debt, basically. He has this sort of gospel of debt-free living that he preaches, and he has lots of callers, and they call up and ask him how to get out of debt. And, um, but his callers, like, he's, he's really a wonderful host in that he really connects with the people who call in, and the people who call in, it's sort of like he's also, he's, he's very Christian in his approach, and, and, and the, the radio shows have a feeling of sort of like, almost like a church where people are sort of talking to him. Um, but he's talking about, like, financial stuff, um, but other stuff as well. So you, this caller, she had a boyfriend, she has two kids, she's living with her boyfriend, and she works in a factory, and she doesn't make much money, and her boyfriend makes a lot more. And um, quickly it becomes clear that the boyfriend is, is sort of the problem that she's calling about. The thing is, um, he's like very, to a point, controlling. We share expenses. I have to give up half of my paycheck to pay for the bills, mm -hmm. to help pay for the bills. When I'm done doing that, then I have hardly any money left to do 
for my kids or for myself or to try and put money back. Mm -hmm. Okay, he says that I can't leave because I would never be able to make it on my own. Mm -hmm. I will admit I'm not very good at handling money. I don't know how. Mm -hmm. well, let, me, let me ask you something. If, if you were sitting down with a cup of coffee, how, mm -hmm. how, how old are you? I'm 41. Okay. If you were to sit down over a cup of coffee with a a 27-year-old mm -hmm. single young lady that was living with a guy mm -hmm. and she told you what you just told me, what would you tell her? To get out, you can make it on your own. Mm -hmm. Good advice. Okay, but where? Did, how do I start on my income? I mean... Well, I'm not positive. You don't make a lot of money. I agree with that. Right. But let me tell you what. You're in a really unhealthy relationship. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with a guy who, um, he's not hitting you, is he? No. You sure? Yeah. I'm not sure I believe you. Yeah, it's fine. I'm sorry? It's okay. I just, I need to... You got to get out of there, girl. You got to get out of there now. Okay. He, he says, you know, that it's me. It's because no, it's not you, darling. This guy's sick. Okay. You got to get away from him. Okay. Okay. And you and think I can survive? Well, I can tell you this. If nothing else, you can start by going to a domestic violence shelter right now mm -hmm. and checking in with your kids, and they will help you. And, and you know, you may have to take a part-time job. Um, you may have to move into subsidized housing. Mm-hmm. Of some kind. I don't know exactly what the short term, the next six months is going to look like, but mm -hmm. I can tell you this. Carrie, you were not designed by God for this man. Okay. So, um, when, uh, so a key question <laughs> when you're talking about a driveway moment is how does it make you feel? What is the feeling that comes out? But when you, you know, you heard it. You could hear what Dave Ramsey heard, right? When she's talking about her relationship, you can, when she says no, how many people believed her when she said no, right? Like you can sort of hear that there's more to the story and that, uh, that once he sort of is talking to her about it, then she becomes a little bit more open and you can hear it resolving. Um, and, you know, I play that clip a lot and I'm always like, there's always that moment where, um, He's like, you got to get out of there. Then I'm always like, okay, is this the first? Is this the moment that I actually lose it on stage? It always, it always almost gets me. Um, and that's the, I mean, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about like a compelling moment. It's something that feels, that just feels very real and very, very emotional. Um, and then you want to talk about where there's a lot that's happening in the clip. So, for example, like how did, you, how did you feel about the caller as, as that, as that clip was unfolding? Anybody? I love her. Uh-huh. Yeah. I just was like, I love you. I want you to be okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I think that's true. I think it's um, because, and this is another thing that's interesting about radio, especially when we were, when we were a while ago, we were, did a television show at This American Life, and, and we were trying to come up with the, you know, sort of thinking about that. And it was very different, like getting ready to do television. Um, and part of it is because like television, what television likes is actual conflict, but it doesn't need everybody to be a good, it doesn't need everybody to have self-knowledge. You know, television you can have, the viewer can have irony in the classic sense in that you know something about the character that the character doesn't know about themselves. You know that, that Kardashians are shallow, you know, ridiculous people, even if they don't know it themselves and it doesn't get in your way, in the way of enjoying the show. Um, but on the, on the rate, well, I mean, maybe you don't enjoy this, but some people it doesn't get in the way. But uh, the but but the but on the radio or in audio, if somebody doesn't know something about themselves, it's uncomfortable. And so part of the love is that you s feel this person who's like who's in denial about something, um, and you can feel it, and it's uncomfortable. It's a little bit of there's some tension there, and then. And then once it's, you break through, it sort of resolves, and then you're, and then, and then we all know the same thing. And you can, and what it does is it makes you connected to that person because now you're all in the same boat of understanding. Um, I think that's a really powerful thing. I think when in, in audio, what we do is we put ourselves in the position of the person who's talking. So in that way, it actually is a much more 
um, bridging form of media. You don't you don't see the person, so you don't prejudge them. You don't throw you know you don't say what they look like or whatever. They, you just you just hear them and you repl you create an image of them in your mind, and that image is probably you know something that looks like you, and so therefore you feel, you're able to feel love for them. Um, so uh, um, how do you feel about the host? That clip. Anybody? Like a dad. Yeah. Uh-huh. In, yeah. in, in a good way. Yeah. Right? Um, mm -hmm. Like a therapist. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like a therapist. Well, I think I, I've often felt like when you're a good, a, a, a good audio host is, um, is often sort of the same thing as being a good therapist. What you're, do, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get people to uh, put their feelings into words. Because what you need is feelings, and you also need words. <laughs> so, so it's often the same thing. Um, you're asking the same kinds of open-ended questions. How did that make you feel? Yeah. Um, all right. So, so that is um, that's one sort of. So that's one thing that you're going for when you're when you're talking about audio. You're going for emotion. You're going for authentic feeling, and some tape, some good tape. Um, because when you're talking about a driveway moment, what you're ta re really talking about is good tape. That's, that's sort of the term that I've come to use for this kind of thing. You, when, you, when you're going out on a story, your job is to get good tape. And so what is good tape? Good tape is emotional tape, A. Um, and for, um, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to just divide it into two categories. One type of good tape is emotional tape. So that's the kind of tape that you just heard on the Dave Ramsey show. By the way, that Dave Ramsey show aired on This American Life. That's how. I came across it, and that's where, that's where that, that clip comes from. Um, and a lot of the clips I'm going to be playing tonight come from This American Life or Planet Money. Uh, the, uh, and sort of like the ur piece of good emotional tape um, uh, that I ever came across was a, was a story on NPR that I heard one time um, that I'm going to play you right now. And it was a... It was from the, the Scripps Howard Spelling Bee, which is a big spelling bee in the United States, and it's like, uh, um, it's like I think it's 13-year-olds, uh, 12-year-olds, something like that, um, and they compete and they spell. And this was the, they just did a quick, it was like a three-minute little spot on one of the news shows that they did where they uh, joined the spelling bee in the final round between this one kid who just flubbed his word uh, and this other girl, Rebecca Sealfon. We'll pick it up uh, at about... Uh, right in the middle of the story. Since Rebecca is the only contestant remaining at the end of round 22, she will now be given the next word on the pronouncer's list, and if she succeeds in correctly spelling this word, she will be declared the champion. Uanim. Uanim. Is what you meaning good? Yes. Is what Anna meaning name? Yes. Uanim! <laughs> Correct. Rebecca Sealfon won the Scripps Howard National Spelling Bee yesterday. Along with $5,000 to go toward college tuition, she took home a laptop computer, books, and other prizes. This is NPR's Morning Edition. I All right. <laughs> so how did that make you feel? <laughs> um, so that is, when I think of like sort of uh, emotional tape versus other kinds of tape, that one is sort of running entirely on emotion. Um, you're not listening to that because you want to hear how U and M is spelled. Uh, you're listening because there's so much going on in the emotion of, you know, that, that girl as she's answering that, that question. And it's so surprising. You know, that's another thing where a lot of times when people, you know, it's what emotional tape is really good, but it also has to be surprising emotion. You know, it's one thing to like a lot of times you'll go and you'll be covering, you know, sort of a tragedy and people are crying over the tragedy. And that can be sometimes good tape, I'm not saying, but sometimes it's just sometimes it's like, of course, there was somebody, a family member was murdered or something, and the the the, the person's very upset about it. And that is entirely understandable, but not that interesting necessarily. Um, and so the job is to try to figure out like a way to either incorporate the emotional tape in a way that, that doesn't feel, and then it just feels gawky, you know what I mean? It just feels like. So, so 
emotional tape is good, but like surprisingly emotional tape is much better. Um, so, uh, but a funny story about that is that, um, oh yeah, what, so why did we pay attention to that, by the way? Do you think? Did we not know it was gonna be interactive? I don't need to make it interactive. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, um... It was a little bit terrifying, actually. Her, her it was a little terrifying. It's is, is very shocking and, and surprising. It's, it's yeah. yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. What was it? What were you terrified of? Put your feelings into words. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, By the way, stop of... for a second. Does everybody want to know the answer to this question? Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. I know because I'm getting her to put her feelings into words. <laughs> it's always good tape when you get somebody to put their feelings into words. All right, go ahead, continue. Why is it terrifying? Uh, her, uh, her hysteria, um, her, her hysteria, frankly, made me feel very uncomfortable. Yeah, right. <laughs> In a good bit, because you were uncomfortable for her. Um, no, I was, I was actually a little bit because I, I wasn't a hundred percent sure that this meant that she knew it. Although uh -huh. once she started spelling the word, it right. became clear that that it was, uh -huh. it was joy. But it, it was, it was unclear if she was losing it because. She knew the word, and she knew that this was she had this thing in the bag, uh -huh. or, or because she didn't, and she was terrified that this right. was it. Uh huh. What about yeah? Okay. Well, it's also so out of context. Everything is really stated, uh -huh. and blah blah blah, uh -huh. and then she just erupts. She goes from like one to eleven. Uh -huh. She yeah. takes it to eleven, and then Buddy comes back and says, "And she won eleven. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's also sort of, for me, I, I mean, I've had a lot of time to think about this clip, but uh, I, I, I think it's partly she was, um, she, there was so much going on in the emotion. Like you get, a, you get a pretty big, pretty, I don't know if it's an accurate portrait, but you get some picture of, of, of this person and all that she's been going through to sort of study for this thing and all the work that she's put into it and sort of like you get a sense of sort of like, what kind of a person she probably is, and and like it's all sort of tied up in her reaction to that, and it just it, you feel like you're learning a lot in that moment. Um, but that that piece of tape. So I, I when I was uh, I first came across that I was I was teaching a course at, at um, Columbia University on, on radio documentary, and I was looking for examples of emotional tape, and I was like, oh yeah, there was that piece of tape that I heard on NPR that one time. Wasn't that long ago? I'm just gonna go get that. And so I went on the Empire website and I started searching for it. And I was going back, uh, and I thought it was just like you know a year or two ago. And so I went and I was looking, and I couldn't find it in a couple of years. And so I kept looking back further, and further. And finally, I went back to the very, very, and I just went and entered spelling bee into the Empire website. And um, I, I uh, 2002, 2001, you know, I got well, all the way back to 97. It was the first year that Empire actually started putting stuff up on their website, and that's where I actually found the story that I was thinking about. So it had lodged in my brain. I thought I'd heard it like a year ago and it had been like 10 years ago. Um, and then I realized that NPR had done a st Spelling Bee story almost every year after that. So that was, as far as I can tell, the first year they covered the scripts Bee, the scripts are at Spelling Bee, but then they'd done it since then. And I think it was because that lodged in the brains of the producers in NPR as well. And they were like, that's oh, some great tape. <laughs> you know, send somebody down there every year. Uh, and so, and then I started to notice that like, so in 99, another Spelling Bee story is on NPR. And then in 2002, there was the Spellbound documentary. And then in 2005, there's the, you know, 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee that goes up on Broadway. And I can't, this is just a theory, and I don't know, like, I don't, but I have this feeling that it was like, it all started from that one moment on NPR in 1997. It launched the entire 2000s spelling bee craze. Uh, so that's the power of audio. All right, so um, when you're going out, so, so, so one thing to think about then is I'm a producer going out or a reporter or whatever, I'm going out and I'm gonna interview my person and I want, um, powerful, compelling tape, you wanna ask the kinds of questions that get you there. And so again, this is where you really wanna sort of, you know, you've gotta get your information across and stuff like that, but you wanna get, you, you gotta get the facts that you're going for. But then at a certain point in your room, you take, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it is, and try to ask some feeling questions. 
um, uh, to try to get these these moments of authentic, you know, moments and emotion. All right, so that's one category of stuff you're going for, emotion. Um, the other category that you're going for, I would argue, is um, uh, narrative, just somebody telling a, a story. Um, and at This American Life, we had this term that when I first started working there, I didn't really understand what people meant by. It was anecdote. And they were like, why, you know, we need somebody to tell us some anecdotes. Uh, but what it meant is a little story. And, by, and, and, and it's, a, it's sort of a term of art that, I, that, I'll, that I, I can tell you about. But first, let me just play an example of one. Um, so um, this is a story that appeared on This American Life a while ago. And it involves an actor that most people have not heard of named Tate Donovan. Um, and Tate Donovan in the late 90s, early 2000s was a character actor who was on, um, who was like got, he was a working actor, he appeared in television shows, but he wasn't, nobody recognized him. He wasn't that kind of actor that got recognized, except occasionally on the way to like, did I go to high school with you, that kind of way. Um, and then, but for a while, he had this sort of like bigger role on Friends, the TV show Friends. And, and when he had that role, all of a sudden he was getting recognized. And this was great for him because he'd always had this dream of being a famous actor. And if he was going to be a famous actor, then he was going to be the exact kind of famous actor that he always wanted to be. Magnanimous. He was going to be a man of the people. He was going to sign autographs. He was going to pose for pictures. He was going to be that kind of famous actor. He was not going to be the kind of famous actor that puts on airs and acts too cool for everybody. So that was his, go that was his dream you know, of sort of being that kind of famous. And here he was getting recognized. He was out at this Broadway premiere. He was getting recognized all the time. And he was getting to be the kind of person that he wanted to be. He was like posing for pictures. He was signing autographs. I was, ex I was, I was exactly how I wanted to be. I was doing it. I was doing great. And then the kid with the camera came along. <laughs> This nervous kid, I don't know, he must have been 16 years old. He's in a rented tuxedo, unbelievably like shy and awkward, and he's got like acne, and he's got a camera in his hand. And underneath the marquee is his date, who is literally like a, a prom dress, and she's got a corsage, and she's really, you know, nervous and sort of clutching her hands. And he sort of comes up to me and he sort of mumbles, you know, something like, you know, something about a picture. And I'm like, oh, I just feel for him. So I'm like, oh, absolutely, my gosh, sure, I have no problem. My God, you poor thing. And, and I go up to his, to his girlfriend, I wrap my arms around her, and I'm like, hey, where are you from? Fantastic guy, going to see the play, that's great. And the guy is sort of not taking the photograph very quickly. He's just sort of staring at me, and he's got his camera in his hands, and it's down by his, like, chin, you know? And, and uh, she's very stiff and awkward, and. I, you know, I don't know what to do, so I just lean across and I, I kiss her on the cheek. And I'm like, all right, come on, take the picture, hurry up. Do you guys want to find out what happens next? <laughs> yeah. So again, that is a story. And so, and it's weird, and I'm going to play what happens next in a minute, so don't worry. But let's just pause for a second to think about what is happening here, right? Like nothing is actually happening. This is not a story about anything. But simply because of the way it has been constructed and has been told, it has created this question in your minds that you so want answered that you're going to sit in your driveway and finish the story, right? And that is, the, that is because of the power of narrative. So a narrative is at its very, very basic core, it's a sequence of actions. It's like, I went out the door and I was looking, you know, and I was on my way to work and I walked by and I looked at my neighbor and then I looked up in the sky and I saw something amazing. And then you're gonna be like, well, what did you see? And it was like a season, you're just like, you walk out the door, there's some rising action, I see my neighbor, I look up in the sky, and then that is at base, that's the basic form of a narrative. And if I say, I saw a cloud, that's a bad story. If you say, I saw a UFO, then that's a good story. But so it, it sort of depends on what they say next. But the, the basic sequence of actions is we are sort of hardwired to get hooked on that. So that is what has happened. He's, been, he's given us the rising sequence of actions. All right, so I'll, I'll finish the story and we can talk about this more. You know, I don't know what to do, so I just lean across and I, I kiss her on the cheek. And I'm like, all right, come on, take the picture, hurry up. And, and finally he sort of like snaps it. And... Uh, I'm like, okay, it was really wonderful to meet you. And he just like st stammered over to me and was like, um, 
could you take a picture of us? Oh. And the whole time, he just wanted me to take a picture of him and his girlfriend underneath the awning of the play. He didn't want a picture of me. He had no idea who I was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, that was a, a producer, Starley Kine, who was interviewing. That's who you hear laughing there. Um, so, so that is like, so that's, and that's the other thing I, I love about audio is that it, it really is, you, you know, that is a story about nothing. Lots of the stories are, are about nothing, but because of, because they're, we're hardwired to sort of listen to what happens, um, you know, we can tell these stories about nothing and they're very entertaining. Um, so a little bit about what's going on there. So, so there's two parts to like a story that done that very, very basic. There's the rising action, right, where it starts and like it starts at a moment in time and it proceeds and there's things that are gathering as it goes along and then there's sort of what I call the punchline or the resolution or the sort of or the you know the, the part where something happens and that's something like I say it has to be surprising or it has to be unusual or it has to be revelatory um, or it has to be funny or it has to be you know there has to be some sort of payoff and often Stories that are good and stories that are bad depend on the payoff, right? The payoff is the thing that makes a story either good or bad. Um, um, and so when you're going out into the field and you're trying to get your, you know, your new spot done or your documentary story done or whatever, you're going for these two main things. You're going for somebody to tell you stories, moments, episodes, or you're going for emotion. How do they feel? What do they think? Um, and uh, and there's a certain kind of, um, and because it's like such a particular need that you have when you're going out into the field to, to get these stories, I've sort of come up with like a, a list of a bunch of just questions that, that I found particularly useful in asking when I do my interviews, like what my interview questions are. Um, and they, they have to do with questions that will, that will get people to talk in stories. So, one thing that you sometimes, I'm sure we've all realized, is that there are people who talk in stories and there are people who, who don't. There are people who are just naturally sort of like, just naturally like, they don't just, they, they, they naturally start at a moment in time and they will tell you like, oh, that reminds me of this time. How did I first get started in this business? Well, I'll tell you, it starts back and blah, blah, blah. And I started doing this and then, you know, this wonderful thing happened. And then you're, you know, with those people, you don't have to do anything. They're going to tell you a story no matter what. But most of us are not that way. Most of us sort of just talk like in normal sort of boring ways, uh, in ways that are not very usable tape. Uh, and so as journalists, we have to prep our subjects to tell us stories. Um, and so what that often means is like, that, and that gets down to the kinds of questions you ask. So I, um, I, I phrase my questions very specifically to, to try to get people to ask me questions. I say, tell me about a time when, because I want to model, I want them to tell me a story, and I want it to be located at a particular moment in time. Um, so uh, I, I say, tell me the story of when, just again, just to model it. Um, a lot of times, if there's like a sort of a, a lot of times what you're doing when you're going out and getting a story is like there's a big story that's happening like you know uh, some subject like grew up and then became you know a famous artist or something like that and you're not going to cover <laughs> the time from when they were born to when they became the famous artist you need to get like three moments from that life uh, and so you want to tr try to figure out like what three moments do you want to get and uh, perhaps there was a pivotal conversation where with a great, you know, with a great teacher or something like that, that propelled them onto their career as an artist. That's the thing that you're going to focus your story on. You're going to build everything around like these two or three pivotal moments in this life. And so, if there was this pivotal conversation, conversations are great. Um, if 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 some sort of action happened around a conversation, you want to go and get that person to sort of. When people are quoting dialogue to you, you're in really good shape. Um, and so if you can just, you know, like some people like, you know, and a lot of times it'll go like this. It'll be like, yeah, I wouldn't have gotten, I wouldn't have become an artist if it hadn't been for my, you know, eighth grade, eighth grade science teacher. 
Um, and then they'll just move on. And then your job is to like go back to that moment. What, they, they, what, ha what happened? And they were like, oh, they just told me a they they just told me that I had a lot of talent that I should stick with it. And then you're like, go back. Where were you when that conversation happened? And then they were like, well, I remember I was about to leave school and I was like really depressed and I was actually going to drop out. Or you know. And then it gets better and better and better as there, as you get more and more details. And then. And and then and then my and then they'll say and my eighth grade science teacher was really helpful and they were like why what did what did their eighth grade science teacher say and then and then you know and then you know well you know she sat me down and she was like you know if you don't become an artist you are going to end up on the streets homeless and that really resonated with me and that's why I became an artist and then you're like okay that's my moment in my story so uh, something like but I mean it doesn't always happen like that but uh, in fact it never does. But, um, but, but that's the kind of thing that you want. Like you've gone from sort of like a general moment to an actual episode in your story. So um, let's see if there's, oh yeah, another huge one. Tell me about the day you realized. Tell me about the moment you realized. Any, anytime you're starting your question with tell me about the moment, you're in good shape. Because <laughs> what you're going for is like, you, you know, moments. Moments that you can sort of build your story around. Um, so, to review so far, uh, stories, emotion, um, you, those are your two sort of like the bricks with which you build your stories. And these are the sort of some sample questions to sort of like build these, get, get people to tell you stories. Um, another thing, um, oh yeah, what were the steps that got you from the hair that I forgot? I looked at this PowerPoint in a while, sorry. Uh, um, Another thing, though, that I have found um, that gets people in trouble and, and sort of like keeps you from the driveway moment has to do with just the conception of the story in the beginning. Um, and uh, this is a, an area where I think a lot of people need, need, need work in that a lot of times we're out doing stories that just are not, they were just flawed from the very beginning. There was nothing interesting that was ever going to happen on this story that we were we were trying to do, um, and uh, and so the the best we're going to do is like get like a you know sort of like a, a half decent story that we've all all heard already, um, and and so how do you do that? How do you cover the world and cover the world in which patterns repeat over and over and over again, uh, but at the same time keep it fresh and keep it feeling like something you haven't heard over and over again. Um, and I came up with this formula <laughs> that, I, um, that I'm pretty proud of. Uh, and um, I actually use it. And I use it. I have other people who use it who work with me. We, we talk about it this way. Um, I'm doing a story about X. And it's interesting because of Y. Um, and I really have to put it in that, in that form. And, if, and like, I'm not trying to reduce the story to one sentence or anything like that. But this really, really helps crystallize what it is that I'm trying to do and what, what's going to make it interesting. Um, and uh, this all goes back to this um, sort of this pitch that I made when I, before I worked at This American Life that I, um, uh, when I was trying to work there and I sent them this long, uh, I sent them this long letter that was like uh, you know, filled with all sorts of pitches. It was like, I don't know, 15 pitches. Um, and they were all horrible um, that I now know. And um, one of them I remember was community gardens. And uh, I wanted to do a story about community gardens. And, um, and uh, I thought that my community garden story could be part of a whole community gardens show. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I thought that the show, I even had a helpful name for the show. I thought they should call the show that my community gardens story was going to be a big part of. I thought they should call that show uh, uh, flowers from the dead, uh, flowers from the dead, dead earth, um, <laughs> which, uh, which I thought was a line from T. S. Eliot's *The Wasteland*, a poem I'd never read. Uh, but um, in fact, the line I, I later realized was uh, "lilacs out of the dead land." <laughs> Meaning that I got exactly two out of the six words right, <laughs> dead, and the. So, um, but so, 
the reason that so there's many problems with community gardens, but first, but first of all, I didn't have like a subject or I didn't have a take or I didn't have a story or a narrative or anything. I just was like, we're we're just gonna just start having community gardens, and so often like we're that you know we're that bad in the beginning. Um, I'm gonna do a story about community gardens. Okay, what are you gonna who are you gonna talk to? Like what you're gonna show up at a community garden and what? You know, like that's the first thing to think through. <laughs> like, who am I going to talk to? Okay, um, but if, if so, there perhaps is an interesting story to be done about community gardens, and so it would be helpful to sort of do this exercise on community gardens. Let's say I'm doing a story about community gardens, and it's interesting because what? Maybe it's interesting because community gardens are a vital part of the community. Is that interesting? You're an editor. You're all editors. I'm your, I'm your reporter. What do you say? How many people say, do that story? Sure. Yeah. How many people say no? OK, let's try again. Doing a story about community gardens, and it's interesting because they're a refuge from the bustle of city life. Why are you saying no to this? What's going on? <laughs> but ser actually, seriously, I mean, I, I, I think you're right to say no. I'd say no, too. But why are you saying no? What, what, what is the reason that you're saying no to this? It's predictable. It's yeah, it's predictable. It's general. It's predictable. Is this surprising at all? Is it surpri if you think through, like, why is somebody going to a community garden? What is, like, going on? If you can come up with the answer before even going out the door, then you know that it's not a good story, right? OK. Doing a story about community gardens, and it's interesting because they're actually drug laundering operations. OK. <laughs> all right, now we're on to something. <laughs> Maybe that would be good. <laughs> right. Now, of course, the, then the problem is that they actually have to be drug laundering operations, which <laughs> often gets it. But I'm just saying, like, unless, <laughs> unless your story can rise to the level of fiction in a certain way, sometimes, you know, that's a good, that's, if it feels like, wow, I can't believe that's actually happening, but it actually is happening, that's a good sign, right? Um, so, um, Oh, we can do this if you want. Is anybody working on a story that they're trying to kick around? We can do it right now. Like, it sometimes helps to workshop these things in front of them. Does anybody want to do this right now? Is anybody working on something brave to step up in front of the crowd and try to do this real fast? It's really helpful, actually. I've done it a bunch of times. It's actually helpful. It'll help your story. No, but no takers? All right. All right, go ahead. Uh, I'm doing a story about a woman who lives on a tanker. And it's interesting because should I answer that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Almost nobody lives on a tanker. Right. Well, see, here's your, here's your problem. This is, this, is, this is what I call a tautology story. I'm doing a story about a woman who lives on a tanker. And it's interesting because it's a woman who lives on a tanker. Sort of, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Which is like close because you've already got an interesting, you've got an interesting X. But like then you, st but it's still not a story yet, right? Like so, what's? Tell me more about this woman. Let's talk about her more. Uh, oh, I'm making this up as we go along. Oh, oh, oh! I was talking about a real. The, no, this is a real person actually. Oh, okay, there is okay. a real person. Okay. Who does that. All and right. she's a, an, an eccentric who has her water comes in through a hose through the porthole, and uh -huh. she lives alone with her cat, uh -huh. and she's trying to tell the history of the port of, of port culture in New York. Port culture in New York. Yeah. Water, and, what life on the water? And why does she live? And what, what's a tanker? What kind of tanker? It's, it's a dead 176 foot tanker. Okay. And so, so sometimes, like, anybody got any ideas? Like, tell me a little bit more. What else? What else more about her? Is she like, does she have family? Is she? Does she have a job? Is she? She has no job, and she put her entire inheritance into this boat, which she bought for thirty-five thousand dollars. And it's 176 feet long. Uh -huh. And she has. And she's been living there for almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. How does she pay for things? Uh, well, they, she fundraises some of it, but she basically spent all her money on, on trying to turn this into a nonprofit, which is it, it is. And, and it was before she bought it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a non, non-profit yeah, exactly. before. <laughs> huh. um, anybody have any ideas about that? How many people want to hear it so far? I sort of want to hear this. I want to hear a little bit. There's some. There's something interesting here. Um, what? What? I want to know what compels her. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. What was behind? What? Okay. So is she crazy? Uh, no, but she's a bit wacko. Uh huh. Well. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. I'm not entirely familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so she graduated 
from Yale with summa cum laude. She's uh -huh. really smart. Right. She's traveled all over the world, but she's she's committed to this crazy idea that nobody else that I know would do. But is she? I guess what I'm saying is sort of like, do you think that she is? Is it was it mental illness that compelled this decision no. or not? Okay. No. Okay. No. No <laughs> such luck. Okay. No, that's good. No, I think that's good because that's a less interesting answer. Basically, if somebody did something crazy because they are in fact crazy, that's like, that's like, oh, okay, well then that just happened, you know. But if it's somebody who's actually doing it for doing something that's hard to understand for logical or rational reasons, then that's a better story usually. Yeah. It's interesting because she's mortgaged her whole life uh, for a quixotic idea. Yes. I think you I think you might want to keep the because the boat and the tanker is is the most interesting part I feel like you might want to save that for the Y and maybe you have a different X oh yeah hmm. I'm interested in the why now of telling that story and if she's at a critical point if she is out of money if she's at a pivotal point in her life you know she had a dream and now mm -hmm. something has to happen and she's virtually homeless but on this tanker like i'm i'm interested in the timing of the story mm -hmm. right in her life well there's something about like i'm i'm i, I want to do a story about you know you know uh a young you know a, a woman who you know had the finest education and went to the top of her chosen career and then uh mo you know took all her savings and um used it to buy a used tanker where she now lives. I mean, there, you're sort of like, and then I'm like, okay, wait, th now you're telling a story, like, and it's interesting because she took all that and used it to mortgage her future on a used tanker and where she now lives in the port. Um, something along those lines, like that can, that can sort of, like with this formulation, what you're, what you're sort of doing is you're giving yourself a, a, a very, 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 you know, sort of like, um, uh, narrow outline of your entire story, sort of where you're going to start and where you're going to end. Um, and I think this is something that we do a lot when we're trying to when we're trying to come up with stories. We we sort of lead with the most interesting part, where like that can be a reveal. You know what I mean? We did a story about new, about wine that was grown in New Jersey, in Planet Money. We talked about like you know there's this, apparently New Jersey has a gigantic wine industry. Who knew? Um, and uh, the temptation is sort of like New Jersey wine, Isn't that crazy wine goes in New Jersey. But then you then you don't have much else to say, you know. <laughs> sort of like then you've got like a whole twenty minutes of a podcast to fill, and you've already. So so we started it with sort of like you know we're going through here and we're you know and we round the bend and we go into the winery and we go down to the basement of the winery and then like five minutes in the guy's like not bad for New Jersey, huh? And then that's when you realize you're in New Jersey, and it's sort of like you by by you know sort of like keeping that. Um, that sort of by withholding the information a little bit later in the story, you sort of keep the tension. Um, yeah. Or is she doing anything with the tanker other than living there? Is she using it for other things, or does she have some kind of other connection to ships and to tankers? Is there some kind of generational thing that an attachment? Yeah. Why is she doing it? <laughs> it's a nonprofit to uh, preserve the. History of the of the harbor, uh -huh. and and you could do that from dry land. Yeah, yeah why? Yeah. Just <laughs> <laughs> bringing people down to yeah. the water. <laughs> you see, that's where she's going for a while. Uh, <laughs> no, no, she it is an nautical. Did she have a family? She comes from a nautical family. <coughs> she comes from a nautical family. But, but yeah. in a kind of nominal way, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I feel like it was a big decision, and I feel like the the way to like locate that story is sort of some something about what like what tell it. It sounds like a pretty radical move that she took and I'd be interested in sort of like knowing like what were the what led up to that move and that's sort of where you would focus the story it seems like um, so the the power of finding the right frame though I think is really um, uh, well it was really powerful is what I, I got lost in a sentence um, but uh started that sentence wrong um, but uh, so I want to I want to play some examples of what happens, what can happen when you get that, that right frame. And these are two sort of stories that, that appeared on This American Life. Um, and the first is a story about that a guy brought to me when I was a producer at This American Life. And essentially it was a story of um, a, sort of a, a parlor game that he, he would play at, at cocktail parties. Um, you know, he would ask people this one question, which would you rather be? Um, 
And he, he would say, which would you rather have, the power of flight or the power of invisibility? That was his question. And so, like, a story about, like, a fun question, conversation starter question at cocktail parties is, like, I don't care about that. There's nothing sort of interesting about that to me. Um, but then he said, I want to do a story about, you know, this question that I ask at, at cocktail parties. And what's interesting is, when I ask people what they would use their powers for, nobody ever says to fight crime. Um, it's like a question that nobody ever says it. And I was like, oh, that's pretty funny. That's like a little, that's a funny frame. And I could imagine that working. All of a sudden, it took this like sort of dumb idea into and made it into an idea that could, you know, we could get a little bit of mileage out of. Again, on our weird little radio show that was, you know, interested in comic journalism. Uh, so, so I said, okay, let's do it. And then he ended up doing this story, and, and it ended up being a very popular story. And I'm just going to play you uh, a clip of that. Flight versus invisibility. This question is only for you. Whichever you pick, you'll be the only person in the world to have that particular superpower. You can't have both. Which do you choose? I started wondering about this a few years ago. I'd bring it up at parties, dinners, wedding receptions. It was more interesting to ask them where people worked or where they went to school, and clearly more fun to answer. Like a magic word, Shazam, flight versus invisibility would instantly change an evening's character, opening passionate conversation and debate. But what surprised me more was how quickly everyone would choose, as though they had been thinking about it for a long time. Everyone knew exactly which superpower they wanted and what they would do with it. Their plans weren't always flashy or heroic. In fact, they almost never were. If I could fly, the first thing I would do is fly into, fly into the bar check out what's going on there, fly back home. I would attach my baby to me and fly to a doctor's appointment at 11.30, and fly right back. Then I think I would fly to Atlantic City. I go into Barney's, I pick out the cashmere sweaters that I like, I go into the dressing room, the woman says how many items, I say five. I go into the dressing room, I put those five sweaters on, and I summon my powers of invisibility into the dressing room. I turn invisible. I walk out, leaving her to wonder why there's a tag hanging from the door that says five and no person inside. So you would become a thief pretty quickly? Immediately. Until I had all the sweaters that I wanted, and then I would have to think of other things to do. Typically, this is how it goes. People who turn invisible will sneak into the movies or onto airplanes. People who fly stop taking the bus. Here's one thing that pretty much no one ever says. I would use my power to fight crime. No one seems to care about crime. I don't think I would want to spend a lot of time using my power for good. I mean, if I don't have super strength and I'm not uh, invulnerable, then, I mean, it would be very dangerous. If you had to rescue somebody from a burning building or something like that, you might, you know, catch on fire. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that was a, that was John Hodgman, by the way, the, of, who's now gone on to fame and fortune in a bunch of other areas. Um, but uh, he uh, he was he. I remember he, he pitched me that story, and we like talked about it for a long time. And I was like, I don't know what is it. There's nothing. I don't, I'm not seeing anything. And then he told me the thing about like nobody ever uses it to fight crime. And then I was like, oh, there you go. There's your angle. And then we. Um, we produced the story together, we got all this tape, and then it was like one of the most popular stories we ever ran and was on a greatest hits thing. Um, and it was all because of that frame. Like that, we knew what to ask. We knew what we were going for. We knew what was the funny part of it. Um, I'm going to play one more example of this. Um, this is a story about a prison arts program. And I know if, if Canadian public broadcasting is anything like American public broadcasting, many of you have heard a story or been pitched a story, or done a story, or tried to do a story about a prison arts program. Is this true? How many people have we? we <laughs> yes, all right. Um, I don't know what it is about public radio and prison arts programs, but we love that shit. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, um, but, and, and I mean, and they're, they're interesting. I mean, like, I, it's understandable. Like, 
prison is a is a place where um, real things happen, where sort of real realizations have to be made, where like consequences have to be come to terms with, all sorts of that. Like it's, it understand it's understandable why so much you know attention is paid to this. It's not it's not I don't mean to just denigrate it, but like it has it is a story that has been done before, and we have to figure out and so we had to figure out a thing. And so this guy, uh, another contributor to this American Life, Jack Kidd, pitched this story. And he wanted. He had a friend, Agnes, who was doing a, who had a prison arts program where she was like, you know, and he was like, yeah, she's this, little, you know, little lady, and she works with all these murderers and this, you know, you know, sort of like high security penitentiary, and it's like, yeah, yeah, I don't know, I'm like not, not hearing it. And he was like, well, what she does is she does, she, she um, puts on Shakespeare plays, and she's putting on Hamlet, and he was like, and what's interesting about it is that like Hamlet is this show that it's all about murder and revenge. Um, and for most sort of like people that do it in college or do it in school or whatever, that it's, all, it's a metaphor, you know? <laughs> but these guys have actually murdered people. So what does it feel like to do a play about murder and revenge when you have actually murdered people and had sought revenge on people and had people seek revenge on you? Does it change the way you see the material? And I was like, that is a really interesting question. Let's find out. So we went and we started interviewing all the people. And the, what we were going to be doing was doing the story about this prison arts program, but we were going to be doing it from the point of view of like, how is the, how is the experience of doing Shakespeare different if you have actually lived out a lot of the plot of a Shakespeare play, which most people have not. Um, and we sat down and we talked to people about that, and it was, it was amazing what they said to us. My name is Danny Waller. I'm 44 years old. Uh, the character that I've played uh, was the ghost of Hamlet's father. The reason I chose that, uh, when I first read the, the script, the words jumped out at me. And uh, they made me feel things that I haven't felt before. Uh, What's, what, what, in your, what in your experience drew you to those particular words? Uh, I took a man's life. And uh, I felt he was talking to me through that. That he, uh, uh, he wanted me to know what I put him through. Uh, I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night, and for the day confined to fast in fires, till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt, purged away. But that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house, I could a tale unfold, whose lightest words would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood, and make thy two eyes like stars start from their spheres. There's one other spot that goes like this. Thus was I, sleeping, by a brother's hand of life, of crown, of queen at once dispatched, cut off even in the blossoms of my sin, no reckoning made, but sent to my account with all my imperfections on my head. And uh, it was, pretty much the same way with him. He, he was, he was uh, taken before his time. So when you, when you read the character, are you, do you feel like, um, who's talking when you say those lines? Hmm. I'm, I'm the body up there. Uh, but the words are coming from mostly uh, William Pride, the the man that I uh, killed. He uh, he's he's mostly the one talking. Um, so that's, uh, that, again, that is the power of the right frame for a story. 
Like, I don't think we would have gotten that kind of tape if we weren't asking that particular question. Um, and uh, so it's important. It's really, and like, that's something that I think about a lot. A lot of the most intense thinking goes into before the story is, before we're even going out on a story, before reporters are going out. Like, what are we trying? What's the, what's the interesting angle here? Um, let me uh, see. I think I've been talking for an hour. Uh, so why don't I um, st stop now and we can, um, we can, because I know that there's questions and answers. Yeah, so, um, so thanks very much for your attention and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Yeah. Um, so you talk a lot about emotion. Uh -huh. and getting emotion from someone else. What I'm wondering is, how do you make yourself emotionally available for that person to, to give that openness to you? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the things, that's a really good question, and I think it's one, one of the things that you have to do when you're going out and if, if, is to, I mean, you're sort of modeling what you want from the people you're talking to, and you're modeling that in a number of ways. Um, you're modeling it in the language that you're using. The more, the more formal your language is, the more formal your questions are, the more formal your answers will be. You don't want that. You know, you want to talk like a real person. Um, you know, uh, and you want to sort of like con consistently be sort of like, um, you know, like it, you know, if like somebody's saying like, you know, whatever, just like a, you know. Somebody saying like, yes, there were hard feelings on both sides. You want to come back and be like, so, so you guys were pissed at each other, huh? You know, and just like sort of model it. Not that you're putting words in people's mouths, but you're like trying to get them to sort of like tell you like a normal person instead of like somebody who's talking to a reporter. I think we fall into these roles when we're, we're reporters, we act like reporters. And when people are talking to reporters, they act like people talking to reporters. And your, your job is to break them out of that. Um, and uh, and then yeah, I think you you want to be emotionally available. You want to you want to like share. I often will share moments where I've felt uncomfortable with people that I'm talking to, or share something you know some sort of detail about my life with people, um, that will make them feel comfortable sharing details of their lives with me. Um, you know I like uh, I've. I've cried <laughs> during interviews when people are telling me like powerful stories, like I, you know, that that happens. Um, if you're listening, uh, you know, um, like if you're listening, if somebody's telling you something real, like you, you know, it's like the more authentic your reaction is, the better. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. I yeah. think there's a flip side to that question. It's not that difficult to elicit an emotional response or to ask difficult questions that will bring people to a vulnerable place. I think another question is where you draw the line in the most difficult stories. I'm, I'm finishing up a story about uh, a suicide of a parent right now. Right. And so I guess sometimes the question is how far can you go? How far can you push a person to a yeah. vulnerable spot? Yeah, and this is where I feel like you don't want to like I think if people, this is what I was talking about before, like you don't want to just like have people cry so that you can gawk at them crying, right? Like that's not what we're going for here. We're going for, if somebody's, if it's surprising, if somebody is like feeling emotional about something because of, because of, and, it, and it feels surprising to you or it feels unusual, then you want to probe that emotion. And you want to, you know, I will, I have sometimes asked like, why are you, you know, why are you tearing up right there? You know, what is it that's making you sad right now about that memory? Um, but I would never say that to somebody whose parent had just committed suicide, right? Like that's a very different, like it's obvious, right? There's, you're, they're in grief. And, um, and I think there, the question, the, there your responsibility is to not, is to acknowledge that this is a grieving person and that it's absolutely real to, to, to be feeling those feelings and not back away from them, but not to encourage them and to try to find out if there's other feelings other than just sort of like mourning and loss. You know, and that would be, that would take it to an interesting place. That is there something, 
if there's some part of it that is something other than just like I intensely miss this person, is there something that I wish that I could have told them, or, or are there other feelings that I that I'm feeling as well, or do I, you know, do I, am, am, is there anger mixed in there, or something else that is like a little bit, again, you're just looking for surprising feeling and not just feeling, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? So, yeah. A bit. It's, yeah. It's tricky territory. Yeah, it's very right? tricky in, territory. In this, yeah. in this instance, and I don't want to get too detailed, it happened more than 40 years ago. Right. But still, we're not equipped to handle, even, even if we're looking for the most surprising things or different angles that are not directly related to the tragedy. Right. It still elicits yeah. strong emotion, right? Yeah. And it, it's sort of, it's a tricky, it's well, a tricky line. It's, yeah, we did, I remember we did a story, we did a show at This American Life a, a long time ago that was about like, just, it was about death. It was loss, it was called, I think it was called Loss. It was like one of the heaviest stories we ever did and I thought, yeah, I thought we were crazy to do it. And like, and we were, going out and like one of our reporters went out and interviewed a, a mother whose son had committed suicide and it was it was it was just weeping the entire interview was weeping and we didn't use it like we couldn't it, there wasn't it, it felt horrible you know it felt like what why are we subjecting this person and our audience and everything to like why do this is you know it's like utterly understandable and it's utterly tragic and and it just feels wrong um, um, but then there's also something, but then there's something that's drawing you to the story and you're telling the story and the grief is a part of it, right? So, um, I mean, there's something about like, I think there are questions that you can sort of talk about around the emotion and how present the emotion still is after 40 years and, and ask the person, is it surprising to you that you still feel this strongly maybe after 40 years? Did you think it would not feel this way? Do you feel like, you know, so, so questions along those lines might help sort of get to, you know, within the emotion, there's still interesting sort of territory, if, if it can. But I think it's, I think you're right, it's absolutely, it's a judgment call. You know, I don't, I, I don't think, emotion by itself is absolutely not what you're going for. If it's, if it's, if, if it's, if it's just sort of abject, understandable emotion, you know. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering what like the X and Y proposition was for startup when you wanted to do that as a podcast. Uh, what was the X and Y? I, well, I, um, I, I mean, I think it, it, it eventually became, I'm doing a story about starting a business and it's interesting because everybody thinks it's about money and numbers, but it's actually about emotion and feelings. Um, that, that sort of became the thesis of it, um, which, you know, worked, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, as, as much as it was. Um, I think originally I thought, yeah, that was, that was pretty much the original idea. Yeah. 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 Um, you talked a little bit about this in the John Hodgman thing, but I'm wondering when you're on the receiving end of a pitch, what are the sort of questions that you ask to kind of take what might be kind of a ho-hum, predictable, earnest kind of public radio pitch and sort of mine for that goal that came out of that piece? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, w I, I, usually, I usually ask why are you interested in it? Um, what's the thing that's compelling you about it? And then I, then I will fight back about like, you know, when people, because people often say they don't know exactly um, and they'll say things that are, that are sort of like, well, because, I, you know, I think it's a really interesting sort of, you know, a lot of times what people say is, um, because I think it's very telling about our culture or something like that. And I'm like, that, you know, that w w but why are you interested? Like, what does that mean? That doesn't make me interested or not interested by itself. What about it is telling about our culture? What is surprising to you? What is, you know, sort of something, and I just, I, I, but usually the, the people themselves will give you the clues to finding out if it's a story or not. And if you can't, if you can't have a 20 minute conversation with somebody about why they think it's interesting and get to a place where you're convinced that it's interesting, then, then usually I just, say it doesn't sound like it's the right story we should work on something else is there something that like tips it in it, it's the moment where I, I mean you all felt it like when you sort of like when you see the hamlet the hamlet thing when it's like oh right they've if if i've murdered somebody how does it how does hamlet feel to me versus somebody who hasn't murdered that's that's it just like it's a compelling thought and like the minute my interest gets peaked the minute i'm like i don't know the answer to that question and i want to find out the answer to that question 
Um, I always say like the, I think one of the most important jobs of an editor is being in touch with their own boredom. Um, and uh, <laughs> truthfully, like, because we are in this room because we are more interested in more shit than most people. That's why you become a journalist. That's why you go into radio. You are just have a higher tolerance for facts and stories than, than other people. Our audience does not have that tolerance, and they, they, they need us to you know, help them. And so, and like, you have, to just, you have to just be in touch with that gut thing where you're like, I'm drifting, or I don't care, or I'm like, I ah, lost me here. You know? And like, just be in touch with it and be brutal about it, but also not be brutal to the face of the person. Just you know, try to like, working through. A lot of times when I'm talking to people who are like, you know, I'll say like, this isn't the story that we're supposed to do together. Like, we should, we should come up. There's another story that's going to be better for us to do together. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you need line, are you, if you're acting specifically about lines that you can use as an editor with freelancers, come talk to me later. I have a, I have a million of them. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering because you've talked, you've talked a lot about the in interviews of themselves. I wanted to get your thoughts on pre-interviews and how much pre-interviewing oh, yeah. you do before you go in. Oh know? yeah. I mean, you need to pre-interview to do to do the to yeah. I, I, it's essential, you know, I think. I, well, it depends on what kind of story I'm doing. Like, so if I, so the first, so for example, the woman on the boat, like that would need a pre-interview and I would just do the pre-interview to figure out like, okay, what are the facts here? What happened? Why did she move in the boat? Where is the interest, where is the story located? What was the thing that, so I need to talk to her for you know, probably 15, 20, 30 minutes just to figure out like, what is her, what are the bones of the story? And to figure out where, what, where do I even want to ask my questions? Where do I want to center my questions around? Um, so that's if you have a story that there's only one possible protagonist to the story. If you're doing a story about like, you know, we did a you know, I did a big story about the mortgage crisis and I had to find people who had been foreclosed on and I had to find people who'd worked in banks. And there I'm just like pre-interviewing because I'm just like casting people, essentially. I needed to find a good mortgage banker. And so I talked to 15 mortgage bankers. Um, before I found the right mortgage banker. And like, again, somebody who could tell them talking stories, somebody who was emotional, somebody who was interesting, somebody who was honest. Um, so a lot of pre-interviewing, it depends on what kind of story you're doing, but a lot of times what you're doing with your pre-interview is you're just basically auditioning people for the best character for your story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of putting yourself into stories, which is something that you often do so start up. Where's the where's the line? Where's the line of self indulgence and how do you how do you walk it and in terms of, of even recording things like uh, your conversations with your wife, how often are you recording and just what are what are what are the, the logistics around those things? Well it's like uh I mean it's really it, it is a it's a it's a it's a it's a line, right? Like and I think um, you, you definitely don't want to gratuitously put yourself in stories. But often, it's nice to have, as a listener, to have somebody whose opinion you trust who can sort of say to you, like, this is, this is what's going on here. Um, so it's often, often I wonder what the reporter was thinking at this or that instance in a story. Um, but then other times it feels like, yeah, it's a little gratuitous. Um, it, it's, I don't know. It's just, again, it's like a gut thing. Um, I think if you, if, if there's something, um, and some reporters are super, super, you know, um, reluctant to put themselves in stories, and often when I'm arguing with somebody to put themselves in a story, it's when something is like, something ambiguous is happening on tape, and I don't know what I'm supposed to make of it, you know, and, and then it's nice to have the reporter in there. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll like sort of be going through edits and, and we'll be asking like, so what was going on here? What were, you, what were you thinking? And if what they were thinking or what was going on there was actually helpful to understanding the story, we'll say, well, write that. Write yourself in there. Write your reaction into that story. Um, or if, if, you know, like, um, like and I'm not sure we're going to keep me in, but this is an example where if you have had an experience that helps explain the experience that your character is going through, and again, this is on startup. So on season two of startup, we're following two other founders, and there's this one founder who was, you know, they went through this tech accelerator, and it's this super high stakes, you know, work all the time sort of environment where they're like working, I don't know, eight hours a week or something like that. 
and um, this one, and and it's all super talented type A, Stanford grads and stuff, and and uh, so this one woman was sort of fucking up, like sort of like not doing that great, and then like through parties where she would have like peppermint schnapps and stuff like that, and um, she was still working eight hours a week, but like by comparison, she was sort of like the you know the screw up of the joint, and um, and I and, and we wrote in this. But she sounded sort of frivolous in a weird way. So I, I wrote in this thing that I remember when I first started working at This American Life, when I was working hours that were equivalent to that. There was like a staff of three and we had to get an hour out every week and it was just sort of crazy and I was working all the time. And I remember when I did have like two hours of free time, all I wanted to do was drink as much as I could as fast as I could because I knew I wasn't gonna have any other free time for another you know three weeks four weeks or whatever it was and it just felt like the most efficient way to like have a good time sort of I mean it wasn't it wasn't necessarily I was a lot younger so I could do it but it's like you know it just and 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 so we wrote that in I'm not even sure it's gonna stay because it does sound a little bit but like that's an example of a, of a place where you can sort of like my experience resonates with that experience and it maybe helps explain it what's going on so Uh, yeah, in the back, yeah. What pitch finally got you the job at This American Life? Um, I didn't, it wasn't a pitch. I, I was horrible at pitching. I got really, I'm, I'm still, I'm better now, but I was, very, I was very bad at pitching for a long time. It took a long time for me to do that. Um, and I eventually got the job just because um, they needed an administrative assistant. Uh, so I, <laughs> I, I took that job. So I was a set, I was like half intern, half administrative assistant uh, for a while. And then during that time, I like did a story or, or two. And then I actually left and freelance for a year and a half. And then by that point, I'd, freelancing really helps you develop your pitching skills because <laughs> that's what you need to survive. So um, after that, I'd come back and I'd done a bunch of stories. And so that by by that point, they could even if I had a bad pitch, like I had some. The reason for a pitch often is is because um, as the editor you don't you don't know you have to expend resources and time and money on this person if they're an unknown quantity like you the only thing you have to go on is the pitch right so so it needs to be good but like the the less experienced the person the better their pitch needs to be which is the horrible paradox but that's the truth um, because the pitch is the only thing you have to go on as an editor and. By that point, I'd done some stories, and I could sort of point to them and say, like, oh, I did this story and this story, so I'm not horrible, so you can, I can work with. And then by that point, it, you know, it worked. But, yeah. But if I'd had to um, pitch my way into This American Life, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I never would have gotten on. <laughs> yeah. You, you, did you I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how much this translates or, you know, how you can look at a lot of, some of the people in this room are doing that personal storytelling and the one-on-one -on -one and the pre-interview would be with the person that you're also going to be interviewing later. Mm -hmm. Are there things that translate for people who are pre-interviewing or working to get the story and then writing for a host? Wait, uh, wait, I'm, I, I'm not, I didn't quite understand. Like, like there are people who are doing personal stories. Yeah, so the stuff that, the kind of things that you're talking about is where it's, right. I might be pre-interviewing somebody and then I'm talking to the person later and it's the same person talking to the person later. Oh, yeah, yeah. As opposed to writing for a host who's never met the person. Oh. You've got the, you know, everybody's done yeah, a, I, a great so, pre-interview and then it's like nothing for Yeah, yeah. So if it's, so what I do then is like, if, if like, so if I'm pre-interviewing for myself, I will, I will literally start, somebody will start and, I'll just basically, I don't talk to them for more than 10 minutes, and my only goal is to figure out if they're a decent talker or not. And if, and if they start, and if they have any moment of, gen, if they're not robots, or they feel like they're like human beings, and they're having authentic emotions, or they're making me laugh, or they're making me interested, I basically stop immediately, and I get off the phone. Because that's, you don't want to get the interview in the pre-interview. You want to save some, some real moments for the, for the actual tape. So, so if I'm doing it for myself, and I know that's the person I'm going to interview, and I just need to get like a couple, I just need to sort of find out if they're good or not, then then I get off the phone pretty quickly is once I've made that determination. And you can sort of tell, like some people, they're not, you know, if there's not like, if you can't get like, a, I throw a couple questions at them, I try to give them an opportunity to crack a joke or two, and if they don't take any of the bait and I can never get anything interesting out of them, I like I won't do it, you know? Yeah, if you're writing for a host. Oh, if you're writing for a host. Yeah, the other way around, it's like. That's Same thing though, yeah. Same thing, I it's think it's. Too far. Yeah, don't go too far, because I did that a couple times where I, like, I sort of got the, yeah, I got the whole interview, I talked to somebody for like an hour, and then I already got them on the phone, and yeah, it didn't work at all, right, yeah. So it's the same thing, I think in both, in both cases, your job is to sort of, it's a tricky thing, the pre-interview. You want to find out what you need to find out for the story, but you also want to get off um, 
before you've ruined everything. Yeah. 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 Um, so you talked about uh, how appealing public radio can be at times. Mm -hmm. um, but podcasts are blowing up. People love listening to podcasts. Mm -hmm. Many of us are addicted to it. What kind of listen lessons can we learn from the success of the podcast world and apply to public radio? Um, I, well, I think uh, that's a good question. Um, people, uh, I, you know, I think people like um, feeling like uh, they have a, a companions or buddies, you know, when they're listening. I think that's a lot of the reason that people listen to podcasts. They feel like, oh, I know that person, that person, I'm hanging out with that person. Um, uh, and I feel like the feeling of companionship, I think you get it a little bit in public broadcasting, but like it's gotten to be a little bit formal, you know what I mean? I think it started that way, but now it feels like it's like this, it's this very sort of stately paced sort of thing. And so I think a lot of what people are responding to in podcasts is that it just sounds more real. They're talking in real ways. They're, you know, uh, they get to talk about things, you know, and then if you, the, the subject matter is often pretty different, you know, like what people are talking about on podcasts. I don't know, what podcasts do you like to listen to? Well, yeah. I listen to, I, I do listen to Startup, uh -huh. and I love Reply All. I, oh, great. I'm, oh, I'm a huge fan of it. Oh, that's I love fantastic. all those internet stories, and uh -huh. I think they do a really good job yeah. of telling it. I think, like many people in this building, I was addicted to cereal and then disappointed as it wrapped up. Uh -huh. <laughs> you yeah. know, I have grew up on This American Life and thought uh -huh. that that was radio until I got here and right. realized that's not yeah. what we do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, like Radio Lab and thinking uh -huh. that we're going to mix a lot of sound and Yeah. I mean, all those I mean, I feel like all those shows have what they have in common is that they're they're just trying to do the things that I'm talking about here. They're just trying to like tell a good story, really. And like they have different they have different styles of doing it, like Radio but Radio Lab is doing the exact same thing. Like they're 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 like setting up like they're creating a question in your mind and they're 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 like Jad will almost always say in, in a Radio Lab story, and let's start the story here. The story begins here. And he's doing the same thing that I'm talking about. Like he's taking a few moments, sprinkling them through. Like they just did the Los Freakies thing about the Cuban. Like they, they, you know, they started the story at a certain point. They started a story with this one character, and they told a, like an episode from his life, and then they sped through to this other moment, and then they sped through to the scene, you know, and then they, so they're doing the same thing. They're talking, and, and they got the, the, the emotional moments, you know, they're, 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 everybody's doing that. In that, in this sort of the storytelling world, we're all using the same bag of tricks, basically. And we're dressing it up in different ways and we have different styles, but like, we're all trying to do the same thing. And that's, I think that's what's going on on those podcasts that you like to listen to. It's, um, they're just employing the trick of the trade, you know? Um, and I know that Jad at Radio Lab, because um, I've talked to him and we're working with a couple of people who work there. Um, they think about this stuff a lot. Like, what is the interesting part of the story? Why are we telling this particular story? What's the thing that we're going for? What's the moment or like, a, what's the unusual part of it that we're going for? Yeah. Um, I think something you've done really well. You work with Planet Money, and you guys work quite all of you as well. Is uh, to explain a really complicated process uh -huh. that you feel like you've you, you get something that John Poole wanted to push yeah, uh -huh. right? yeah. So do you have any thoughts on how how you bullet point stuff, how you how you get some really dense information across to people in shorthand? Mm -hmm. Kind of the way that you do it. Yeah. I, as, as, it might not be surprising. I have a lot of thoughts on that, <laughs> since that's what we were trying to do all the time at Planet yeah. Money. Um, we uh, so the first thing that we did, like the reason that we often, the reason we have two hosts, uh, grew out of a solution to that problem. Um, so when we first did the giant pool of money, we were, um, it was just this really complicated story, and we, and it was like. You know, one person telling it, like no matter how many times we did it, it would just sort of speed by. Like you would try, you'd be talking, and then like people would be like, "Wait, what?" And you real, you it was like to the point where you literally needed to build in the "wait, what" into the story, because it, people would were just asking it. So you had to mimic it and give people time to catch up, and give people time to sort of adjust their brains to understanding it. And we ripped it off entirely from Radio Lab. 
which, and I'm sure they were doing it for the exact same reason, because they're doing these complicated science stories. And so, like, when, when, like, Robert is saying, like, to Jed, like, wait, what? You mean it's the blah, blah, blah? And Jed's like, yeah, it's the blah, blah, blah. That's, like, part of it is shtick, but part of it is, like, necessity, you know? And so, so you have to adjust the tempo somehow, um, because there's certain concepts that, the, that you that you got to catch up with as a listener, and you got to make sure that people understand it. And there's certain concepts that one metaphor would make it understandable to half the audience, and then they'd need a second metaphor that would make it understandable to the other audience. And so you got two people giving, one person gives one metaphor, the other person gives the other metaphor, and then hopefully that's 100% of the people who are listening who finally got it, you know? Um, so that was, so that's one thing, slow it down. Um, have to, you know, sort of have, like, manufacture sort of a conversation. Uh, you don't need two hosts, but if you can do it with, like, <clears throat> if you can do it with a guest or whatever. Um, and then, you know, really good metaphor is really helpful. Um, we did a story on This American Life and Planet Money on this hedge fund called Magnetar that had a very complicated investing strategy that involved, in buying, that involved buying credit default swaps on certain tranches of CDOs that they had sort of participated in the assembling of these. Anyways, like this very complicated thing, and then like what would happen was they would they would be involved in buying, they would be involved in the assembly of one very complicated financial product, and then they were buying another complicated financial product that was essentially an insurance <coughs> policy against the first financial product. And then when the first financial product blew up, they got paid out on the insurance policy. And uh, we were going back and forth on like, well, what's the metaphor here? And then finally, we were in a meeting and then Ira said, oh, it's like the plot of the producers, where, um, <laughs> where uh, the producers, they, like there's this moment where they're like, you know, you could make a lot more money on a play that fails. If it fails on the first day, you could make more money than you can with a hit. And so they, then they assemble and they go about making the worst play in history, Springtime for Hitler. And that's what exactly what the, you know, that's what the allegations were against this, this hedge fund, that they were essentially aiding in the creation of things that only they understood to be the worst CEOs in history, and then they were secretly buying you know, these insurance policies against them so that when they predictably failed, they got paid out. So, um, so that was like, so without that metaphor, we couldn't have done the story. The metaphor was in, in essential to understanding it on the radio. You could not understand the story without the metaphor. Um, uh, and then, a lot of times when you're dealing with like complicated topics, a lot of times it's because the people who, the experts you're talking to sort of don't understand them either. Um, and they're just trying to bullshit you a little bit. I think that was happening a lot during the housing crisis. Um, and so just really, you know, you're a smart guy. If they can't explain it to you, then something's amiss probably. So um, just paying it, you know, just not being afraid to ask dumb questions, you know, helps. Um, now, that's a really key one to me, is like not being afraid to ask the dumb questions, like the really dumb questions um, that will, you know, that take you back. And you're allowed to do that because you're not an expert and, and we, should, we should embrace that, you know, opportunity we have more than we do, I think. Anything else? Any other? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm doing a, a three-part documentary on science and democracy, which is kind of... Science and democracy. Science and democracy. Yeah, it's called uh, the Science Under Siege. Uh -huh. and about scientists in, in, in Canada, so internationally. Anyways, uh -huh. what I'm terrified, besides not knowing anything about science, but what I'm terrified right now is that I've got to do my narration. Uh -huh. So that's um, three hours, three hour, one, three one hours. Can you give me some tips about narration that you use that you, in, in order just to have... Because that can kill a fantastic documentary, yeah. as you know. How many um, have you done? Have you done a lot of narration? Yeah, but I mean, I'm you know, I, I'm always looking for tips yeah. about narration. Um, I think so. I mean, I, the reason I ask is just because like the tips are different if you're if you've done this a lot before or if you're new to it. So, but you're like seasoned in terms of like so you're just worried about it being flat or just like losing energy yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, then my my like. You know, nor the normal tips of just sort of like try to pick a person in your mind that you're talking to. I often like try to um, have somebody that I'm like a producer or somebody that I trust who, who, who can sort of be with me while I'm, if I'm tracking something particularly heavy, 
so that they can tell if my energy's flagging or if I'm not, um, or if I've lost, if I've lost them, if I'm not, if I'm not hitting the words right. Um, if it's if it's complicated, like a lot of times I will change change language. Like I'll think I'll get the language I'll write in my script, and then I'll be in the booth, <clears throat> and I'll um, you know I'll change I'll change the words a lot. You know I'll rewrite stuff in the booth if it's not working very well. Um, uh, what are the other tricks that I use? I don't know. Sometimes I stand up, you know, <laughs> if uh, if I'm just not feeling it, you know. Um, <coughs> I don't know. Is that are, are those helpful? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's hard though. I mean, it's hard. It's especially if you if you have to carry a long, whole hour, on your own. I think, um, you know, it's it's tricky. You know, I think it's like you know, it's just it's hard. It takes a long time. Leave yourself enough time basically to track it. You know, it takes more time than you. It always takes more time than I think. Yeah. All, the time All right. Thank you so much. Well, thank you guys. It was really fun.